All right. I was talking about um, my experiences within the Chirological Society. Uh, and I thought I'd talk a little bit more about that because it's probably quite difficult for people who weren't involved at that time to kind of get an idea of the extent and the scope of the work that we were doing and, and how much of it there actually was. Um, the Chirological Society, as I encountered it in 1983, was um, in a fairly sort of rudimentary form, it hadn't really quite got itself together. Um, it was re the Chirological Society, originally founded in 1889 by Catherine Sinner Hill, um, kind of got def came defunct by about the 1930s, but Terry Jukes decided to restart it in 1975, along with people like Joe Bulaitis and Doran Swade, and very quickly came the first uh, book on, on, on this version of palmistry, which was called No Nonsense Handwriting which just came out in 1976. Um, and it's evident from looking at that book um, that the, you know, the ideas were still in developmental form at that, that, that particular point. And I remember having a conversation with Doran Swade about how did the elements get assigned to the lines of the hand? Um, and, uh, and that was an interesting discussion because one of the things that came out from that was in the very early versions of the book, for example, the minor what we now came later called the minor earth line or the Saturn line in traditional palmistry terms was actually allocated the fire element. Johnny Fincham, you'll be interested to know um, that your predilection for that has, has a precedent going back to 1976. Um, so, you know, that was, it's a very formative time and there's and, and a lot of the early material in the Chorological Society um, really wasn't very good. It was still trying to form and work itself out. It hadn't kind of settled into anything. And it wasn't until 1982 that the, the society started producing what could be termed a regular journal. And, um, and I have all the journals. I've got everything from 1982 right through to 1999. Uh, 1999 was the last year that that, that society produced uh, anything, any, any journals at all. Um, so it's a very concise period of time, um, longer than the original uh, London Chirological Society, which I think only functioned for about 10 or 11 years um so we so did better than that um in about 1982 is when dylan warren davis became the secretary of the chirological society um uh maybe 1981 um and as i mentioned i got involved in 1983 so he was running the, the, the organization at that time and that's when the journal started happening and um and they started becoming more systematic in the, in the presentation um 1987 dylan left the chirological society and went his own way and and the, and it was the secretary because then became, became a woman called maggie dobson in london who didn't nothing of of note particularly um so she didn't do any writing work or research work it was more of a, a nominative position as far as i could see and then i became the secretary in 1989 and that's kind of when things really took off and if you look at the kind of quality of what was written before 1990 and after 1990, there's a kind of world difference in terms of what's being produced. Basically, up until about 1988, 89, <clears throat> Terry Jukes was doing most of the writing. I think my first published article in that journal was in 1987 on vocational analysis from the hand, which was part of my intermediate diploma study work. Um, and then after 1990, pretty much all the journals are written by me. Um, with lots of articles uh, by various people, and I can show you what they are. So just uh, bear with me as I move across to show you the extent of this work. It's going to be a bit tricky with this, doing it with this camera, but I'll do my best to try and show you um, the sort of range and extent of the material that we covered. So um, to give you an example, that's the an original 1982 uh, series of notes. And that's often what they were. They were just kind of series of notes or, or extracts from what became the books. Um, and it, there's not an awful lot of, um, not an awful lot of actual technical and useful handwriting information in there. Um, but we, as it, as it kind of evolved, it became much more of a two-part two thing, a journal and a, and a series of technical note sheets. Um, and so you're looking at one of these would be, that's been an issue for each, for each quarter. So these would come out every, every four months, winter, spring, summer, and, and autumn. And we would have various different authors writing to them in them. Um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the pieces in, in there were like articles, like this is an interpretation of the hand of a sex offender from, collected from 
prints that one of our members had access to a high security prison in the UK. So we were able to look at the hands of some very serious criminals. Um, some of them were like technical sheets like this one here, for example, which is um, from a significant piece of research that was done by myself and Felicity Booth in 1996, 97 on the endings of the major waterline. And so this is a pictorial representation of our findings. Um, that I think in, in my mind still stands as one of the most important pieces of research that um, I've ever done um, because no one had ever looked at the major waterline to assess its its significance and in terms of the endings. And when we did it, we studied about two and a half thousand handprints and discovered there were 17 distinctive endings, uh, sorry, 18 distinctive endings to the major waterline. And we've compiled a huge report about that. Um, so yeah, a lot of the work that was done was kind of like quite serious uh, research work. Uh, if you go down here, that's some of the early journals, 1982. Um, 1987, that's my article on vocation analysis. Um, we got stuff by Dylan Warren Davis there, the elements of health analysis. Um, and then, oh, look, there's something from Isabella Harantz. So a lot of, there were a lot of different authors from around the world that contributed to, to the journal as well. Um, one on the major airline. There's a study that I did on the hands of children and, and the hands of the elderly. Um, Chris Swain, pretty much an expert on the upper minor waterline at that time. Um, and then we get into sort of more serious researches um, and discoveries, um, some of my historical stuff, the Digby Roll, um, really pioneering discovery into the significance of the minor fire line or the Apollo line, uh, written by Carolyn Abrams, who had a very good one. Oh, there's the um, research work into the major waterline. That was actually a three-part journal. Um, the, we, we, one part to, to outline the project and two parts to outline the significance and meanings of, of all those endings to the waterline. So you can see we just illustrated all the different various endings. There's a double major waterline, the Simeon line, um, and various complexities within that. Um, uh, we've got work by uh, Tama Brill, uh, The Hands of Heretic Jews, um, Lynn Seal, The Hands in Psychological Diagnosis, Rupert Allison on The Divided Self, Claire Conway on Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. So there were quite a number of different authors who contributed to the journal over those years. Um, and, you know, it was a very kind of fertile and rich experience for us all because we were basically trying to thrash it all out and trying to work out uh, what all the different features of the hands meant. And that's one of the reasons why the advanced uh, seminars were so important because um, so my time in the Chirological Society really kind of can be divided into two parts. There's 89 to 94 um, when I'm doing all my writing work and research work. I had access to the Bodleian Library in Oxford and that's when I researched the entire history of hand reading, um, which uh, enabled me to go back to um, the earliest manuscript I found was from dated from 1160 on chiromancy. Um, and I was also able to study all the um, all the sort of li scientific literature on dramatic lipics and, and medical discoveries about the hand as well, because all that stuff was also in the, in the library. So that was kind of a really concentrated studying and researching time, like 89 to 94. And then the period from about like 93 to about 97, um, is when we were doing the the advanced study group seminars. And that, as I mentioned yesterday, was mainly myself, Johnny Fincham, Laura Thornton and Johan Henborg. Um, and we would get together every three or four months and take a topic of discussion. And then other people would come in and, and, and contribute. The kind of the condition was you could only participate in the, in the seminar if you actually uh, presented a paper uh, on something. So people came in with their particular expertise and when we were talking about mental health in the hand or we did a research weekend on, on sexuality in the hand uh, and, you know, so on and so forth. So we kind of like covered an awful lot of different ground. And part of that kind of was kind of to share our knowledge and understanding. Um, and what came, what came out of that particularly was um, we uh, kind of evolved the teachings of chirology from all, way from whatever Terry Jukes was doing. Um, and um, poor, poor guy never understood what we were doing really, but he was just happy that, you know, the, the, the group was thriving. We had about 120 members. Um, 
obviously a lot of them in the UK, a lot in Croatia, and then other parts of the world as well. Um, so various different people who studied with me, I you know, joined the Chirological Society because I, in, in from about 1992, I also ran a correspondence course. Um, so I taught um, by sending out, if you can believe it, C90 tape cassettes. Um, and there are a number of people around the world who studied um, in that particular method. Um, so Lynn Seal in the UK, Birath Birath in Sweden, Tamar Brill in Israel, Jenny Hirsch in, in South Africa, probably the ones that you might have heard of. And, and it's, and it's, and it's um, wonderful for me to discover that 30 years later that they're still doing hand reading and uh, still practicing as hand readers and are perpetuating the knowledge that I was uh, disseminating at that time. Um, actually, all of that knowledge, you can see those, um, just see over there, that, that way, no, that way. You can see the, the, the black attache cases up there. Um, all those all those lectures are all recorded on there. All the advanced seminars are recorded on there. And all the tuition that I gave um, by correspondence is all up, up there as well. So there's an archive of all, those, all that teaching from that time. Um, so, yeah, it was an incredibly productive time. And, and I think for people who, who are kind of quite new to hand reading or have only seen uh, the kind of noddy uh, approach to palmistry that you get in most books, it's difficult for people to comprehend how much more detailed and much more sophisticated um, chirological analysis is. Um, and when you have a collective of people like that who are, are working together, and sharing resources and sharing understandings and sharing perspectives, of course, it makes it uh, an incredibly fertile environment for, for new discoveries. Um, just to take one example, and probably the, one of the more famous ones, um, when we were talking about emotional and sexual analysis from the hand, uh, that's where Johnny Fincham presented his paper on uh, what came colloquially to be known as, as the passion line, um, which you can find, I think, written about on page 115 of his book. Um, spellbinding power of palmistry, and um, but that was a kind of that was a conversation that he brought to that discussion group because he um, he had done the research and found this particular line formation occurring in the, a certain subset of people, um, and then was able to bring it to the to the group, and then we would all discuss it, and we would kind of work out how to think about it, um, and add it to our, our our body of knowledge, and that was kind of how a lot of that stuff kind of evolved and developed because when you've got active practicing hand readers, Johnny Finch and Johan and Laura were all very active hand readers. I mean, I was too, but I mainly did more studies. Uh, I did more, I was anyone who's doing any of the studying really. Um, and they all relied on me and what I would, what I came up with were those things, but it was, it was kind of collective uh, collaboration, uh, which was a wonderful thing to be part of. So I'll share more of that as we go through this, but I just really wanted to kind of get a kind of framing of the ex extent and scope and of the of the work that was done in that period from 1989 to 1999 in particular um, there's a lot to unpack in that but the richness of it um, shows the depth and profundity of this subject and that it goes way way beyond um, the popular conception of hand reading as a kind of fortune telling or predictive uh, acting in a parlor game so Stay tuned, subscribe, and we will find out more as we go along. All right?